What is up guys, Wrestling Premiere is here. We finally done it, a CM Punk video. The title run that smashed records. I have some, well not some, but a lot of very fond memories of this run. Thoroughly enjoyed it as a kid, you know, almost every peer review match delivered. And while Punk and some may not look fondly at it, I think it's cool that he got to hold the most coveted title in WWE for over a year, and beat John Cena's record from 2007. Another minor thing I loved from this run was character development. What I mean by that is Punk never remained the same guy in the 434 days. He slowly transitioned from being a guy that fought for the fans, wanted them to be satisfied, and there's a name for that. Voice of the Voiceless. Suddenly he was being upstaged and started to demand respect and at the same time, he was losing just that with the fans and the man began comparing himself to God. His ego was growing with each title defense, yet he was relying on external help. It's a good run itself, but it's time we talk about it. So right now, let's get into it. So CM Punk had gone through a hell of a lot at this point. His free push ran into a sledgehammer, and he was taking a few L's. The Triple H loss was kind of random to me. I don't understand it, but he was once again champion soon enough. The second city saint captured the belt at Survivor Series in MSG by forcing Del Rio to tap out to the Anaconda Vice. Following night on Raw, he kicked off the show in order to speak about his title victory the previous night. He got sentimental over wanting to do this, you know, winning the title at Madison Square Garden, and Punk said that the title is where it belongs. Fans started chanting his name and even called himself the new face of the WWE. Punk reminded everyone how he wanted to make the title in WWE itself interesting again, and one of the things he said he'd like to change is the status of John Laurinaitis. Immediately after hearing this, interim Raw GM came out. He agreed with Punk. He said that they want what's best for the fans, and he claimed to not understand why Punk hates him. So the champion responded to saying that Lauren Ice is fake. He's the middleman in corporate who's two-faced. He called him all kinds of things and Lauren Ice didn't seem to understand what Punk was saying. He felt that he's got an edgy side as well and because he took the offensive remarks to heart, Lauren Ice booked him in a title match against Alberto Del Rio for next week. As if the champion was scared. He won the match tonight but Big Johnny opted to have him face Dolph Ziggler. CM Punk called it stupid because it confirms his statement, you know, that John doesn't listen to the fans. They want Dolph Ziggler and Zack Ryder but obviously the stooge didn't change the match. Hell, he even told Punk that he couldn't beat Ziggler. This was no big deal to him. He even said that somebody, someday, is going to be some sense into Laurinaitis. So this was the beginning of the feud. Obviously, it's extremely similar to Austin McMahon. You had the edgy, untypical top guy who was yearning for something other than the usual, and the corporate executive who preferred to do things the traditional way. The match between Ziggler and Punk was pretty damn good. It served to be a nice precursor to the eventual matches. And it's just a shame that they peaked here because despite the awkward finish, I believe this was their best match together. Now that Alberto was well rested, he was going to challenge for the coveted gold, but Big Johnny had his doubts. He mentioned the loss of the pay-per-view which seemed to frustrate the WWE and its sponsors, apparently. And CM Punk, though, had a different view to this whole thing. He preferred to make fun of everyone in that room except for Ricardo, who I assume didn't exist in Punk's eyes. And with regards to this match, they were given plenty of time to construct something decent. Their previous matches were good and this was no different. Both men initially had the same thought. Go for that arm in order to lock up their submission move. After the commercial break, Alberto was in control, Punk was making mistakes, and mistakes that left his arm out in the open such as this. The champion did have a glimmer of hope, but Del Rio was one step ahead. The match itself was very methodical, and some might not like this, and I can see why. The attack also boosted CM Punk's momentum meter, and he began that comeback. Fans started waking up, Del Rio struggling to find an answer, and this is when the match kicked up a notch. The action was very 40-60, to 60. nobody was outright dominating, although I give the edge to Del Rio. Punk used Rodriguez's devious tactics against him, and this of course was from the book of Latino Heat. CM Punk used the exposed turnbuckle to steal the victory. He of course didn't expose it, but turnabout's fair play, right? Ricardo tried objecting to this, but his complaints were met with a GTS. Overall for a TV match, I'd say it was good, but if it was on pay-per-view, it would fall short for certain. Since the Del Rio experiment was like that one guy who tries to repeat his funny jokes, he was still in the title picture. On the December 5, 2011 episode of Raw, it was revealed that CM Punk was set to defend his title in the TLC match at the namesake pay-per-view. His opponents, though, were not set in stone, you see. John Cena, The Miz, and Alberto Del Rio, they laid claim to a title shot, and so Johnny Ace booked each man in a match. If they win, they're inserted into the TLC main event. Also, what's more 2011 than a WWE Network Ed and Skrillex? I remember there were some polls on the network, but hey, this ain't the video for it. The Miz and Alberto Del Rio qualified, John Cena followed up, and this image is just weird. Cena though realized that he's essentially given a title shot every few months, apparently, and instead got Zack Ryder his US title shot for TLC. Dolph Ziggler screwed up and saw the match was confirmed to be a triple threat match. At the end of the night, a contract signing for it was held. Since Punk was the voice of the voiceless, he called out the WWE contracting, and he said that Lara Nice should stand there like Jack Tunney and allow them to fight. This was when Big Johnny announced the TLC stipulation. CM Punk didn't think much of this because he had already beaten those two losers. Miz, meanwhile, didn't like Punk mentioning Survivor Series instead of what followed. You know, how he beat up R-Truth. Miz tried getting all serious and mentioned that Morrison took a beating so bad that he was released. And this was when Big Johnny explained how he wishes him the best in his future endeavors. Damn. Basically, what Miz was trying to say is that he was dangerous now. 
He destroyed people who were once his friends. Imagine what I can do, yada. You guys know. Alberto had enough of the bickering and told Punk that he's the best in the world. And he promised to win the title again and told him that they can do nothing about it. CM Punk knew where the promo was going and so Miz once again got serious. He said that despite his differences with Alberto, no matter what happens at TLC, CM Punk will not be walking out as a WWE Champion. They both signed, champ follows up, and the match is official. Since pro wrestling does entertainment like no other, for good and for bad, we all know how this went. Laura Nice wanted to photo op for the match and Punk being the outcast of the family made fun of this. He wanted a Pier 6 brawl and he started the fight himself. This almost went awry for Punk but he found a way out and it turns out he was John Cena now. You know, it's destroying the opposition and standing tall. Alright, this match, it didn't really have much of a build to it, you know? It's just a way to close out the year for the champion and for these guys. And that's all. On the Slimy Award episode of Ross, CM Punk managed to win a few awards. He won the Pipe Bomb of the Year Award. I mean, that's expected. I mean, you wouldn't expect Teddy Long to lose a Tag Team Match Booker Award, right? But in one of those speeches, he showed just how much of a joke the Executive Vice President was. Of course we can't forget this video package was set to that Transformer song, you know? You got the touch. In between those awards... Punk took a beating from Del Rio in The Miz, which of course affected his chances at TLC. Because of this, he wasn't able to accept the Superstar of the Year award. Johnny Ace accepted the award on his behalf, much to the chagrin of the crowd. We're done with the build. I don't think anybody was worried Punk was losing, especially so early into his run. The match though did put more effort into the problem of a lack of a build because it was pretty damn unique as well. Before the match, Alberto straight up admitted that he was using The Miz. They were already boosting their own egos, talking about how there was no alliance or something along the lines of that. And Miz even said that Del Rio's title run was about as eventful as the Ravens' Super Bowl victory. And the Baltimore crowd was angry. Del Rio said that Miz couldn't take on his pool boy and Ricardo was treated like trash. I mean, it's expected. Alright, we talked too much about that. What about the match itself? For one, it was the main event, the final match on the show. Why? Because John Cena wasn't there. Simple as that. It's not like John Cena was on the card and they're like, oh, the CM Punk match is better. We should have a main event. No. That Baltimore crowd, by the sounds of it, was 100% on CM Punk's side, of course. And in the beginning, all that talk over no alliance or whatever was a lie. Until Miz turned his back. The alliance was in the mud and it turned into a regular triple threat with the use of weapons. CM Punk had this moment where he was on fire but it all came crashing down when he was handcuffed. Even then he broke through but after realizing that this man was a huge liability, Del Rio kicked him through a table and went on this violent outburst. At one point Punk and Miz even worked together. Ricardo was tipped over insanity all over the place. The whole handcuff thing once again haunted Punk and it was like his title was slowly pried away from him. Miz was looking like he thought of WrestleMania 27 and all of a sudden Punk whacked him. And at the same time Del Rio was slowly climbing the rungs. Punk was desperate, fans were chanting his name and he eventually broke loose and this meant chaos. He dropped both men, climbed up to the very top and he retrieved that title. Good ass TLC match. I don't think it's mentioned all the time but it was seriously one of WWE's most entertaining main events that year. Like, I remember watching it for the first time, and it was so damn fun. Matter of fact, I enjoyed the entire show, and if you're a fan of, say, Zack Ryder, CM Punk, Daniel Ryan, this is a show to watch. As I said earlier, I don't think anybody was worried or scared that Punk was losing the title. It was very obvious that he was just gonna go through them and head to the Royal Rumble. Moving on from TLC, Punk celebrated his victory with Brian and Ryder. It's one of those images that would have looked odd early in the year. Then there's this image, which is personally one of my favorites because it represented the change. It felt like the beginning of a new era. With that said, on the December 26, 2011 episode of Raw, John Laurinaitis opted to taunt the fans in Chicago with a clickbait entrance. This is apparently excitement to him, but Punk himself interrupted. As expected, he had the welcoming reception. To Punk, it was like Lauren Ice was antagonizing him. He's patronizing him and the GM though was in a festive mood and gave CM Punk the gift of not competing tonight. Turns out it was just to show how unpredictable he was. He actually booked the champion in a gauntlet match with the winner of that match receiving the title shot. Punk responded to this asking, well, what if I beat them? He didn't have much of an answer, so Punk wanted a fourth match. He wanted a match against Laurinaitis himself. He acted all tough saying he doesn't want any of this and claimed that it would be unfair to see on Punk himself. And a UK wrestle chat intensified. The champion was eager to get that match made and so Laurinaitis obliged. Yeah, about that one, Punk was doing some good work, but Johnny Ace came in and distracted the ref. He then did the same thing to Punk leading to the Dolph Ziggler victory. This meant he was the number one contender. Oddly enough, the match did a main event Rob, whatever. So let's talk about it. It's a title match. It's essential. It was fairly even early on. Both men were trading shoulder tackles, side headlocks, all that. Punk makes a huge mistake and it gives Ziggler the control. The champion after the commercial break showed fighting spirit, but Ziggler was still in the fight. He wasn't staying down for long. He was doing everything well and from out of nowhere, Punk exploded with the knee in the bulldog and it seemed like the end was nigh. But then Johnny Ace made a run in and in other places... CM Punk actually scored the W, except the ref didn't notice. Ziggler though didn't capitalize on this the way he intended to and instead, he won by countout. 
Ziggler was celebrating like he won the damn title, and this meant the story was anything but over. Punk called Laurinaitis out over this, and he booked another title match between the two for the Rumble. With himself as a special referee, I should know. CM Punk threatened to beat him up like a bitch if he screws him over, and the build itself to the match was extremely similar to the first arc of Austin McMahon, in the sense that whoever was facing Austin was basically second fiddle, such as Dude Love himself. In other places, Punk was insulting Ziggler for trying to fit in and having to hide behind a woman. Matter of fact, he didn't seem all that worried with Ziggler, focusing on WrestleMania instead. As for John Laurinaitis, he was scolded like hell, you see. He had reversed the decision in Punk's tag team match because Mick Foley replaced Daniel Bryan, so this unlocked one of those famous pipe bombs. Punk had a hell of a lot of fury during this promo. He grabbed that mic, said that Lara Nice is gonna do nothing about this, and was telling him to bring his balls out. He even said that the reason why he hates Punk is because nobody knows who Lara Nice truly was. Sure, he had the look, but other than that, he sucked. He said that his brother was a part of the Road Warriors, whereas he was Roadkill. Punk began burying him, calling him all kinds of boring terms, and said that Lara Nice couldn't accept this and took on a job wearing a suit. He didn't like seeing Punk find success. The champion said that he's gonna be screwed because of jealousy, but hey, no matter what happens, he's still better than Johnny. If he gets screwed, people are finally gonna be talking about Laurinaitis, he's gonna be looking like he went through a meat grinder because CM Punk kicked his ass. He was glowing red at this point, and in order to regain that heat, Laurinaitis admitted that he is gonna screw CM Punk at the Royal Rumble. He was extremely frustrated with the lack of respect coming from everybody, and from out of nowhere, he whacked Mick Foley with a microphone. Alright, that promo sure felt like a go-home one. It's like, hey, the pay-per-view Sunday, but that wasn't the case, because there was still one Raw episode left. But yeah, that was definitely one of CM Punk's best promos. He literally called out every single one of Johnny's insecurities in his face and managed to add a little more hype to the match, even though it was somewhat predictable. Now, it's important to actually talk about the events of this episode. Well, with that said, CM Punk continued where he left off. He called Lara Nice a failure at everything, and he also felt that his fate had been decided and wanted to do something about it before the Royal Rumble. You see, CM Punk wanted to hear Johnny say all those things to his face. Instead, though, John Cena came up. The actual John then appeared, and CM Punk was desperately trying to go Larnias into this, but he didn't, and he booked the tag team match instead. Once again, he got involved and cost the champion yet another match, and this didn't change Punk's stance. He was gonna beat his ass, and he decided to challenge him to a match. This time, though, he actually accepted. About this, Larnias was held under review for his performance as GM, and this greatly affected Sunday. It was a wake-up call, and he apologized to everybody, including CM Punk. He even inserted Mick Foley into the Rumble match, and also claimed that he was going to officiate the match the proper way. David Otunga was revealed to be the substitute, and yes, he was easily jobbed out. CM Punk was absolutely incensed, he was raging, yet Laurinaitis put his hand out. So Punk, being the good person that he is, pulled him in for the GTS. That was probably the loudest pop of the night. His excitement, along with the crowds, would disappear when Ziggler ran in and hit the zigzag. I'm just gonna say, this is simple. Dolph Ziggler was certainly in the background for this buildup. It was more about Punk and Lauren Ice. As for that title match, it's not that memorable in my opinion. Obviously, Ziggler received that Rising Star title shot, similar to Razor Ramon in 93. And watching this, you expect more. It's decent, but when you see them already deliver some good-ass matches in the past, the match is kind of disappointing. But anyways, John Lauren Ice was relegated to Special Enforcer, and he ejected... Vicky Guerrero out of ringside. In the beginning, there was some quick-ass counters. Both men had each other scouted. The champion whooped his ass initially until he went up top. Ziggler took his time in wearing down CM Punk, elbows, chin locks, and at one point, the sleeper. There was this decent counter from Punk where he hit this blue thunder bomb that ended up being his opening. Both men were countering each other, avoiding disaster, but then drama ensues and the ref gets knocked down. So we all know where this is headed. Of course, CM Punk had it figured out by then. He had yet another huge chant, but no official was in the ring. Larry Nice did enter the ring, but he took a kick to the back. Then Punk has GTS, refs phased, and Johnny's whining about how he took a kick to the back of his neck. As for Ziggler, there was this nice famous her, it came from out of nowhere, but other than that, there wasn't much drama coming from him, and in the end, CM Punk won it. Lara Nice made the pinfall as well, and I'd say this was a good match. It's not great, it's not out of this world, not think it's something you should go out of your way to watch. What this also meant was Ziggler was back where WWE loves him, the mid card. He would continue gaining experience as the weeks went by, would be one of the bigger rising stars of the year. As for CM Punk, well, somebody had a huge issue with his best in the world moniker. Before we get into that, this was just a place hard to pass time basically for CM Punk. It wasn't that big of a deal, and there was more interest in the Punk and Laura Knight story rather than the whole Dolph Ziggler thing. The next night on Raw, CM Punk faced Daniel Bryan. These two were already familiar with each other and were friendly, but Daniel Bryan said some not so nice words about Punk and made himself seem much more better than him. On the same night, it was also revealed that the Second City Saint is going to defend the title in an Elimination Chamber match. The Champion vs. Champions match was pretty competitive, and the match was going well, but Chris Jericho of all people ran in and hit the Codebreaker. He had yet to utter a single word and was just running around doing nothing, this was the first time that Jericho and Punk were feuding. 
They had crossed paths in the past, but it wasn't anything serious. The codebreaker Chris Jericho was back to being his 2010 self. So like this return was something different, it was kind of a continuation of the previous run, but instead of suits, Chris Jericho is now a rock star. That's the best way I describe it. The following week, he explained why he attacked. Y2J said that it's the end of the world as you know it. This man just loves his rock references. Jericho said that everybody in this company is desperately trying to be him. I mean, Soulja Boy has that problem as well. He called the fans wannabes, pointed the finger at them, and he was proud of manipulating them upon his return. He mentioned how the Miz was mimicking him with a suit and the tone of his voice, Kofi with his in-ring skills, R-Truth. He's like, oh, it wasn't what's up, it was shut the hell up in the past. Dolph Ziggler, he's walking out with Vicky while Chris walked out there to the main event WrestleMania with Stephanie McMahon, and of course, he left the champion last. Called him a liar straight up, why? Because he was calling himself the best in the world. According to him, this was incorrect. It was a false statement to Chris, and unlike Punk, he doesn't need to write it in the back of a t-shirt. He's just that. His resume speaks for itself, and funny enough, he mentioned how he got through 28 men. Chris revealed that he was back in the WWE to reclaim what's his. The WWE title that the champion himself interrupted. He didn't speak with words, rather with actions, and Jericho was so damn disgusted. It's like Punk pissed on his Fozzie albums or something. He even turned his back and offered a free shot, but Y2J never budged. Later that night, a six-pack challenge was held with the winner entering the chamber last. Jericho ended up screwing Punk and stealing the final spot in the matchup. This image is shockingly something that never officially happened. It's so odd to think that with the seven world titles Y2J won in his career, the spinner never sat on his shoulders. With regards to the match, it wasn't bad. The Raw guys opened up the show and Punk in particular started the match with Kofi Kingston. Similar to the SmackDown match later that night, it blends in with the others, so don't go into it thinking, oh, it's Survivor Series 2002, otherwise everybody would have been talking about it. Punk did find himself in awkward situations such as this, but he managed to weather the storm. Once Miz came in, he whooped ass. Punk took a hell of a lot of punishment because of him, but nonetheless, Miz found himself in the Anaconda Vice. Luckily though, Chris Jericho entered and those two fought. Failed finisher attempts from both men, a lion saw him. there was a scary moment for Chris, but he caught Ziggler with a codebreaker. Then, he was dropped on the chamber. Punk was ramming him into the chains and was hell-bent on getting his hands on Y2J, but his arm paid the price. After a bit, Kofi hit a super crossbody and tapped to the walls. Jericho tossed him out like trash, and once he turns around, CM Punk kicked him in the face, essentially eliminating him. It was obviously a way of prolonging the story at hand with CM Punk, and in the ring, the WWE Champion showed great resiliency and hit the GTS for the 1-2-3. Decent match, as I said earlier, it's not something you should go out of your way to watch, similar to the Dolph Ziggler thing. I actually prefer the SmackDown Chamber match more so than this. Might be a hot take. That's what I think personally. It's pretty forgettable, honestly. Like, you're better off watching any of the other chamber matches. Before I refer to the topic at hand, I would like to mention the random beef between CM Punk and Chris Brown. I obviously won't make a video on it here, so let's talk about it quickly. After the elimination chamber match, CM Punk randomly posted on Twitter, I would like at Chris Brown fight somebody that can defend themselves. Me curb stopping that turd would be a WrestleMania moment. Brown responded saying, as CM Punk needs more followers. He's such a leader. Not to mention the roids he's on had made it utterly impossible for him to pleasure a woman. The hell? What Punk is referencing is of course the Rihanna incident from 2009. It garnered Brown a lot of criticism. Well, not criticism, hate. And Punk wasn't done. He told the Huffington Post in regards to Chris Brown, Put some gloves on in the ring and I will choke you out and make you feel as weak and powerless and scared and alone as any woman has had the misfortune of knowing any sad cowardly little boy as yourself and all proceeds can go to a woman's charity of my choosing. It's a very random feud and Brown never responded, maybe due to someone whispering in his wee ear. Logically, of course, you know, it's not gonna make him look good. I often think about it here and there. I just thought I should add it to the video because, well, technically it is a part of the title reign. I don't see how I should make a video on this because it's not that long, honestly. Back to the video. In light of the chamber loss, Chris Jericho was seething. He called the previous night a travesty and mentioned the rules of the match. Clearly to him, he was not eliminated, but for all of Chris Jericho's whining, it wasn't going to matter in the grand scheme of things because he was inserted in a 10-man battle royal, with the winner moving on to challenge CM Punk for the title at WrestleMania. This was also the famous Wade Barrett injury match. Apparently they were bringing back money in the bank just for him to win. With regards to the match, yes, Chris Jericho won it. It's as obvious as Big Show turning every once in a while. Punk was of course impressed with the victory and put his hand out. Jericho opted to walk away with a smirk on his face instead, optimistically thinking WrestleMania is his night. At the same time, CM Punk had a champions match to prepare for. He was set to face Daniel Bryan, and similar to their previous match, it had a controversial finish. This time, both men were fighting in favor of the other GM, and after whooping each other's asses for several minutes, they pinned each other clean 1-2-3 on the mat. Teddy was ready to square up because of this, and it served as a backdrop to their WrestleMania match. As for CM Punk, he cut one of his most memorable promos of the title run the following week on Raw. Initially, the best of the world was set to face Daniel Bryan in a re-re-rematch, but Chris Jericho refused to allow the match to commence. He instead preferred to speak. 
Mox J felt that his statements were much more important than the match itself, and he praised Punk for being good, but put him down saying he's not the best in the world at everything he does. To Jericho, the difference between Punk and himself is the fans. They were the ones calling him the best. He didn't need to print it on a t-shirt like the champion. Jericho even went as far as to say that he's one of the last of a dying breed. You know, guys that became stars before WWE. Guys that didn't care about politics and instead were focused on having the best matches. Jericho admitted that it gave him a bad rep in the back, but it didn't matter to him because in his mind, he knew that he was the best. As for CM Punk, he followed his footsteps, but at the end of the day, he wants to be Chris Jericho. Punk had enough of this and offered his rebuttal. Similar to what Y2J said, he praised his talents but didn't appreciate the whole plagiarism thing. It's not like Jericho invented the whole best thing. In the past, there was Bret the Hitman Hart. The best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. He was cracking jokes about him, but to Jericho, it's no gimmick. The proof is inside the ring. His accolades speak for his claims as well, but the champion saw it differently. Jericho's body language was screaming inferiority. Maybe just maybe Chris was desperate to prove to himself that he's the best. The whole confidence thing in Punk's eyes is a facade. It's jealousy. Punk said that he surpassed Jericho and sure, he beat Rock and Austin on the same night, but he was never the man. According to the champion, it bothers Chris to this very day, but regardless, it's Jericho who's responsible. And the most memorable part, this is the most memorable part of the promo for me. Jericho was called out for being a rock star and Punk said, quote, while well, I was out there swimming with sharks, you were dancing with stars. Chris's response was all about mentioning how deep down wherever he was, the same thought popped up in his mind. CM Punk copying him. This is the one thing he was thinking of regardless of where he was in WWE outside, it didn't matter. He finally admitted his true intentions for returning. It was to expose CM Punk as a fraud, take the title away from him, and to shove the whole best in the world thing down his throat. Punk didn't see why Jericho had to do all of that in the past, all he had to do was challenge him to a match. Punk also took time to poke insults towards that jacket and he said that on April 1st, we'll finally learn who's truly the best in the world. After Chris looks at this very image in Miami, it's not going to be the end of the world, it's just going to be Chris's, you know? It's over for him after WrestleMania. Suddenly, Daniel Bryan interrupts and they have the match. And that was one hell of a promo. It's for certainly the most important moment in the build to the match. Both men showed what they were truly about, and I loved how Punk forced Jericho to the breaking point. In kayfabe, from my perspective, Y2J didn't appreciate somebody upstaging him and taking his moniker. He didn't enjoy this at all. And Punk verbally hit him where it hurts. Clearly incensed with what had transpired, Chris Jericho ambushed CM Punk after his match with Daniel Bryan. He body slammed him on the steel and even locked him in the walls. Following week, those two faced off in the tag team match and they of course interacted, but as expected, they were going to leave the interesting stuff for April 1st. However, Jericho got one over the voice of the voiceless and that wasn't it. A week after that, CM Punk's demeanor changed greatly. So after his match with The Miz, Chris Jericho popped up on the Titan trying to reveal some personal information. He revealed that Punk's father was an alcoholic. He was seen as a huge weakness to Jericho and that's the one thing that keeps Punk up late at night. Regardless to him, him, alcohol is in Punk's future. You know, it didn't matter what was gonna happen, he was gonna drink eventually. And he claimed that that shall happen after he loses the title at WrestleMania. These insults, especially the pathetic little drunk, left Punk speechless in the middle of the ring, but wait, there's more. You see, Chris Jericho refused to rest until he had a proper grip on the WWE Championship. On the March 19, 2012 episode of Raw, the Second City State came out all emotionless. He was full of emotion inside though, it just wasn't positive. He revealed that Chris Jericho was not even in the arena and claimed that that's a sign of what kind of a man he was. It wasn't like the story was false or anything like that, but it wasn't his business. Add to that, he revealed it to everybody in the world. He explained what was going on in his personal life in the past. Punk went on to talk about the negative effects of alcohol and he said that at WrestleMania, he'll let the monster out if there's one and refuse to allow his past to control his future. All Jericho failed to mention is that his father overcame his demons. All Y2J was in his mind was an obstacle. It's just a way of proving that he's the best in the world, but that wasn't it. Why? Because Chris Jericho had a hell of a lot of remorse for his controversial statements the previous week. He assured Punk that it was 100% him and apologized. He promised not to say anything about his father, but his sister <laughs> and the crowd went crazy upon hearing this. They knew he shouldn't have crossed that line, and Jericho mentioned his sister's drug use and claimed that it's inevitable that Punk is heading in that direction. The champion was staring a hole at the Titan Shrine and said that Jericho is bull, and he promised to beat it out of him. Intense stuff. CM Punk was now on the evil playing field, someone with Chris Jericho. He's trying to get a little advantage out of him, but he ended up bringing out his worst side, basically. Unfortunately, though, Christian fell victim to this, and just before their match began, Chris Jericho appeared and Punk's like, not again. This time he revealed additional information. Punk was born after his parents' wedding date, which according to Jericho, makes Punk the legal definition of a bastard. Christian tried taking advantage, but this amounted to nothing. And he was beaten up so badly that he was put back on the shelf in his first match back. The hell? Asked about his thoughts, CM Punk said that his family is off limits. What Jericho said about his sister and mother are all lies, and he ain't no bastard, he's the best wrestler in the world. With regards to WrestleMania, CM Punk and Chris Jericho were the semi-main event. Before the match, Johnny Ace told the Second City Saint that he didn't want to brawl out there. To ensure it, he told Punk that if he gets disqualified, he loses his title. There's nothing for him to do here except breathe hard. As for Chris Jericho, 
His entrance went about as well as the GTA Trilogy release, you see. Christian and Brodus Clay were too busy messing around with the $15,000 jacket that when Y2J entered, it was all screwed up. Like, look at him. He was desperately showing the light upside. He's just trying to weather the storm. And so let's talk about the match. Early on, you can notice the intensity coming from CM Punk. He was obviously on a leash due to the stipulation, but this didn't stop him from being intense. Y2J was intelligently provoking Punk in order to force a disqualification. He's shouting, how's your father? You're not in the main event. Okay, that's an exaggeration. He didn't say that. But as good as Jericho's strategy may have been, at the same time, he did absolutely nothing with it. High drama around here, but the champion realized that this wasn't the way to go. And in light of this, Chris Jericho took control. There was this impactful suplex onto the floor, and thus, the dissection of CM Punk began. Y2J specifically targeted the back, as that's where Punk suffered the most damage. He did show some fight, but it didn't lead to much here. It took him a while to actually fight back, and this is when the match kicked into high gear they're starting to hit each other with their best shots code breaker go to sleep but despite all that neither man stayed down for the three count or tapped out at least yet their heads were being cracked into barricades posts and the best moment was when jericho caught punk with a mid-air code breaker truly a wrestlemania-esque move the crowd was really into this and they believed that it was chris's night when you watch it now you think it was possible punk though broke free and caught y2j with the anaconda vice jericho scratched and clawed and he pulled through but once again punk locked it in this time his knees couldn't catch punk and so he tapped out one Hell of a match, I'm just gonna say. That was better than I remembered it. It looked rough, stiff, and it checks off all the boxes. I would even go as far as to say that it's somewhat underrated. I love the story itself with CM Punk being at a disadvantage and being forced to lower his intensity. Story, check. In-ring action, check. Atmosphere, check. And I'm not gonna lie, heading into it, I thought it was a good match, just not something that's outstanding. Punk's statement of having the greatest WrestleMania match of all time was not there, of course, but still, you gotta watch this one if you haven't, because up to this point, I'd say it's CM Punk's best match in the title reign by a mile, by a distance. Sounds stupid, but I still feel hyped. Five minutes after finishing a match from nine years ago. The next night on Raw, CM Punk made the big mistake of once again talking down to the new general manager of Raw and SmackDown. He thought it was the perfect moment to be Clash Clown, and due to this, he was forced to defend the title against Mark Henry. Clearly, the champion was suffering from his match the previous night. Add to that, Mark Henry and Kayfee was booked to be one of the strongest wrestlers at the time. Matter of fact, I'd say from September to December of 2011, he was the toughest wrestler in Kayfee. It's a title match, so you know what's up. Henry didn't need to do much in order to expose the injury in the champion. He quickly tried bringing the fight, but even with the crowd on his side, Henry proved to be an uphill battle. The match was set on easy mode for Mark, and it was extremely wide sided but from out of nowhere, the champion dropped Henry with a DDT. Suddenly, Henry was starting to make more mistakes, not in this instance, and after the commercial, it was looking real bad. From out of nowhere, Punk pulled things together, and he had the crowd on his side. He connected with that elbow, but the damage was done. He was hurting badly, but then from out of nowhere, Mark pushed him away and accidentally won by countout. Realizing that the title isn't coming to his waist, he let out his anger by inflicting additional damage to CM Punk. Immediately afterwards, John Laurinaitis informed everybody that CM Punk is defending the title more often from here on. Y2J took notice of the chaos unfolding and sarcastically spoke in his favor. Because they had a classic the previous night, Jericho wanted to celebrate with a drink. He proposed a toast to his father and to Punk himself. And he poured the drink and suddenly slipped like he's Steven Gerrard. Of course, Jericho knows all this and concluded the assault by cracking that bottle. And this man didn't give a damn. He was pushing the boundaries and if Vince allowed him, he was actually going to do more. I'll get into that later. The following week, CM Punk was once again enraged with Chris Jericho's malicious actions. He violated the strategy code and Punk said that he understands that strategy is a foreign concept to some, but to him it's a personal choice. The choice didn't make him cool or trendy, it's just, it, it, it's a way of life. And then Chris Jericho comes in his way. Punk said that he didn't enjoy all these types of remarks towards him and his family. And even though Jericho did use the mind games as a tool, he still tapped out at WrestleMania. So he takes it one step further. Punk was just so disappointed around here and he felt that he smelled like his father and was shedding tears. Suddenly Jericho appeared on the Titan Tron and accused the WWE Champion of drinking. He claimed Punk was going through a downfall and Jericho also said that last week he showed him what it's like. For the first time to be CM drunk. The champ rose from the man and started cutting a promo saying that Y2J is failing to realize that sending him, Punk, to the dark side. Because he was going to channel that dark side and bring out all that negative thoughts to life by going after Chris Jericho. No longer was it about being the best. It was simply about fighting. Somebody's going to get their ass kicked plays and it's time for yet another title match. This time though was very different. You see, CM Punk had a little too much adrenaline by his side. He was pissed off like a madman and quickly got himself disqualified. Break the walls down plays and you'd think Jericho was stone cold with a beer in his hands. Henry wasn't down for long though and he left Punk easy pickings for Y2J. From out of nowhere though, the champ struck and so Jericho adapted the situation to hand. Alcohol was once again on Punk's body and somewhere stone cold was crying due to the waste of all that alcohol. Oh, and if twice in a lifetime wasn't enough, there was a third title match between the two in England. 
Early on, Punk went all out. He gave it 100%. This was due to the fact that the match was no DQ and no countout. However, Mark didn't stay down for long. The champion had to bring in a chair, which also hurt him greatly, and also helped that the challenger was making more mistakes. It was like chopping down a big tree, and yes, CM Punk was successful. Quick match there, regular TV stuff, and it's not something you'll be thinking much about. For the 20th time, Chris Jericho was on the Titan Tron, and he informed everybody that he had a title shot for Extreme Rules. He also announced that it's going to be a Chicago 3 fight. And the look on Punk's face. He was more than thankful for the opportunity to beat some sense into Y2J, but he responded questioning his status. He wanted to know if he's drunk. All of a sudden, Chris brought out some video that relates to punk and alcohol, and apparently he visited a pub. His explanation was simple, friends. But Chris didn't believe a second of this feeling that punk was delusional. He told him that his dignity is gone, and extreme rules, his title will be gone as well. Before he can respond, Jericho disappeared. As time went on, it seemed like Y2J's claims were factual, why? Well, the following week, he sent his opponent a liquor basket. Later that night, Alex Riley claimed to saw CM Punk drinking from that gift basket, and therein lined a non straight edge individual. And Y2J was over the moon. He walked into Johnny Ace's office and asked him to strip Punk of that title. This worked in his part, and all he had to do was verify the claim. So what they were going to do was have CM Punk take a sobriety test. The intoxicated champion came out all wobbly and denied being drunk. But there was nothing he could do. He incorrectly recited the alphabet backwards, and because of this he was forced to walk the straight line. That went about as well as his matches with Elijah Burke, and Y2J wanted the situation to be done with and demanded the title be handed to him. Just as the title was slowly being pried away, CM Drunk, as Jericho likes to call him, asked for one last chance. His arch nemesis thought the situation was cleared and didn't require another chance, and soon it was revealed to be a ruse. Punk blasted Jericho and delivered a slew of strikes to send him running. Laronius in the back was seething, but there was nothing that could be done. Cool segment. The match had some hype behind it at the time. The feud was pretty intense, but again, no matter what Punk was doing, there was always someone or something above him. That said, he had the home field advantage. I love the dark undertones with both men wearing jeans. It really sold that this was no competitive match, or no joke. It was serious stuff. The fans cheered on CM Punk like he was 96 Jordan, and already it was intense. He wasn't trying to take it slow, no. The match sort of resembles something from a previous era, and if you were to describe it to somebody, they would not say it was from the 2010s at all. It, it just felt like something from the early 2000s. The usage of weapons was already in effect, and the match had only lasted for 4 minutes. Y2J was taking it a step ahead as he usually does, like this guy would die for heat. They went as far as they could with the whole PG rating. Once again, alcohol was on the menu, and every time he'd do something provoking or offensive, it would bite him in the ass. Things did eventually go his way, but this was CM Punk in Chicago, who was a 99 overall. The commentary by the sounds of it were having so much fun calling this one, the champion was risking it all and reaped the rewards after Jericho lost the plot and screwed himself over. For the second time, CM Punk showed that he was the best. Great matchup, very enjoyable watch. I prefer WrestleMania 28, but that's just me. This one is elevated by the atmosphere. Even if it was bad, it was going to be good with that crowd watching the matchup. It ain't my match of the night, but for certain, one of the most memorable bouts in CM Punk's title reign. From a feud over the best in the world moniker to a heated feud over personal matters. I thought it was enjoyable. Jericho played his part well, and I loved a bunch of their promos together, especially the one where Y2J revealed his true intentions. He couldn't stand seeing somebody actually back up the whole best statement, so he resorted to calling out CM Punk and his family. At the end of the day, while Punk just wanted to kill Jericho for his statements, Y2J was still desperate to prove that he was indeed the best. The feud could have been crazier if Jericho had it his way because the man wanted to tattoo his initials on CM Punk. But that's what he wanted to do, but Vince vetoed it because, well, they're PG. That's my perspective, and my favorite match between the two is, of course, WrestleMania 28. I highly recommend that one for any of you that never watched it, and I slept on it a bit as well. The next night on Raw, it was announced that a Beat the Clock challenge was booked with the winner challenging CM Punk for the title at Over the Limit. A certain physically outspoken individual won the whole thing. That sounded stupid, but it was Daniel Bryan. If I had to give somebody Wrestler of the Month for April of 2012, it's either him or Brock Lesnar. Brian was massively over even after taking one of the worst L's in WrestleMania history. His Yes channel was rapidly increasing in popularity, and the peak of it was probably when Raw was in London. The crowd was just eating it up. Brian was also a SmackDown wrestler yet was competing for Raw's title, and the brand split at this point was broken like a copy of WWE 2K20. CM Punk did not allow for the American Dragon to celebrate for long, opting to show him what he's about. On paper, it's two technical wrestlers going at it, but the story was a bit more deeper. If you told somebody five years earlier about this, they'd think you were smoking whatever RVD or Riddle had in their pocket. Punk and Brian were both the pillars of Ring of Honor. They embodied what pro wrestling outside of WWE was, and it seemed very unlikely these two would actually face off for the most coveted gold. But a lot could happen in five years. The WWE switched up their philosophy and actually gave the smaller guys more of a chance. 
But with that said, CM Punk was punished for disrespecting Johnny, so was forced to face Daniel Bryan in Tenzai in a handicap match. Oh yeah, this was back when A-Train returned and got the early 90s monster push, meaning he obviously beat CM Punk. Afterwards though, the challenger for the title went for the yes lock, showing that he ain't no joke, I guess. At the same time, AJ of all people started taking a liking to CM Punk. She's of course the ex-girlfriend of Daniel Bryan, and the champion sensed that this could be a setup, but... It clearly wasn't, if anything, Punk offended her saying she's been unstable. Punk and Brian's interactions weren't really memorable. Before making this video, I couldn't really think of much for the build of Over the Limit, but there was a little something on the final SmackDown before the pay-per-view. Johnny Ace once again made things hard for the Second City, saying by booking him in a match against Kane. It was a way of softening it up Punk in order for Daniel Bryan to have a huge advantage. His ribs were being worked on, and it didn't help that his opponent added fuel to the fire. Dan O'Brien looked on in awe and amazement as his chances of winning the title increased gradually. But anyways, whenever this match is talked about one way or another, the topic leads to John Lauren Ice and John Cena. Every time. Do I think they should have main evented? Yeah, I mean it's a match of the most coveted prize and it's not like John Cena's out there facing the rock again. I think the one thing that goes against this match was the hype. The build wasn't exactly memorable, but regardless, I think they should have ended the show. So let's talk about it. This proved to be a technical masterclass, one hell of a professional wrestling match. Both men were quite strategic early on, Brian was very aggressive with the kicks and forearms targeting the ribs. Punky was going after the leg and neither man was outright in control around here. I'd lean a bit towards Daniel Bryan though. Both men were fast and elusive of each other, attempting roll-ups and I'd say that the most memorable part from the beginnings of the match was when Brian locked in that modified surfboard which was transitioned into a guillotine of sorts. The crowd was split, one side was like Daniel Bryan, the other CM Punk. The match was extremely different to what everybody was accustomed to from WWE at the time. It was a different approach and they told a pretty good story with the holds, the kicks, the slaps, and the intensity. You could feel it. Once CM Punk burst out, the match kicked up a notch, but Brian caught him with a yes lock and technically won it. It was booked tough out there and only screwed himself with a huge mistake. Great stuff. Some consider this to be a top 5 WWE match from the year, and as I said, it had a different feeling to it and easily stands out, but with the ending, this was anything but over. An upset Dan O'Brien addressed the events of Over the Limit the next night on Raw, and his frustration showed as he didn't do his usual yesing. The man believed that he was entitled to being the new champion and clearly disregarded the fact that he lost clean in the middle of the ring. Despite this, he was more than confident of his chances in a future matchup. CM Punk heard his grievances and cleared the controversy. That was by introducing his opponent, Kane. A few minutes later, Punk was making him tap out. In other places, AJ was still bugging the champ and was still rude about things. He realized that talking to her is like walking on ice and quickly tried fixing things. Hell, he even said that he digs crazy chicks. At the same time, we had a cover star in our hands, yeah. CM Punk was revealed to be the cover star of WWE 13, the game that brought back the Attitude Era. Funny enough, Sheamus was the original guy for WWE, but THQ though battled for the WWE Champion and honestly, it's a minor touch, but he fit the whole vibe that they were going for, you know live the revolution or something along the lines of that. So Brian and Punk faced off in yet another match. AJ this time around thought why not get his attention by wearing his damn t-shirt and standing at ringside. Her interference actually cost Punk the match and it clearly meant that a rematch is on the horizon between those two for the title. All of a sudden though, Kane popped up and he whacked Brian with a chair, returning the favor from SmackDown and even chokeslammed him on a chair. AJ though redeemed herself by passing Punk a chair that aided him in getting rid of the competition. Since Laura and I still hated CM Punk for existing, he booked yet another title match, but this time, Kane was the opponent. Similar to the Mark Henry matches, Punk was eager to drop the big monster. This was working initially, but when Kane was awoken, his strategy was thrown out the window. AJ suddenly appeared and slowly Punk was finding himself back in it and Dan and Brian interferes. Even though the champ was on a roll, he hit that elbow, Kane was ready to hit a chokeslam, but it ended in a DQ finish as a result of Bryant's interference. However, it was a big red monster who stood tall. So obviously he was inserting his name to the title picture. Shortly afterwards, the triple threat match was booked for No Way Out. Bryant took enough time out of his empty schedule to throw insults in AJ and Punk's way. There was still a lot of tension between those two, and it again crept into the rematch on Raw. This time, Kane actually won the match, you know, to actually make you believe that he might win the title. I don't think any of us thought he had a chance. AJ was starting to get real comfortable becoming the center of the whole storyline. Punk wasn't outright affectionate towards her, but he was still teasing it, such as wearing this shirt. She was enjoying every second of it and even kissed him. <laughs> Turns out she was messing with all the guys. Kane even more so. On the topic of the triple threat match, fun. Nobody talks about it because it isn't all that memorable, but in the beginning, the indie guys managed to get rid of Kane early on in order to clash. It didn't mean much in the grand scheme of things and the monster dominated with its power and strength. His presence meant that the other two had a gloomy and brim cloud above them. The New Jersey crowd was something, it wasn't dull at all and the crowd really enhances it. Each man had their golden opportunity to score that W but they found no success. We had another AJ bump and punk retained. The positive from this match is the fact that she didn't hog the spotlight for long because after all these men were wrestling. You know they're wrestling on pay-per-view match for the title. She wasn't, 
but her interference was apparently some sort of favor for CM Punk. In the next few weeks, AJ was still wild and she was loving all three of those men. Punk was desperately eyeing the correct time and place to tell her how he truly feels, but before he could do that, a hell of a lot went down. First of all, she was revealed to be the special referee for his Money in the Bank title match with Daniel Bryan. And second, she was feeling a little off because Punk never watched her match. And find this, she contemplated jumping through a table. Both men were desperately trying to convince her otherwise, but it turned out to be contrary. Punk was kissed and pushed through that damn table along with Bryan, and Michael Cole attributed this to AJ being troubled. He got ahead of himself talking about a potential relationship with her, then Bryan embarrassed him right out of there before trying to get AJ back. CM Punk, though, saw right through it. Unlike Daniel, he was clearly hurting from the previous night and told AJ that she isn't right in the head. Not exactly like that, he was just alluding to it. His opponent though claimed the contrary, he's like, you don't care about her, I do. Brian even said that Punk needs AJ in order to beat him. Then all of a sudden, she just randomly kissed him and poof, title's gone. Yeah, now this is 2012 AJ we're talking about, she's essentially like the big show, you know, she turns left and right. She quickly approached Punk and did the same exact thing. The two men were left more confused, but CM Punk didn't want to give off any mixed signals. Before he could once again say anything, AJ proposed. His reaction is like you showed him the future of WrestleMania 29, and upon hearing this, Brian went insane. He's trying to get all up in her head, but Punk straight up told her his decision at the end of the night. And after Daniel proposed, Punk said that he didn't want to marry her. He said that it was morally the right thing to do, and he got a slap for his troubles. Brian wanted to capitalize on the situation, but he got the wrong reaction as well. And so basically, the build was more about AJ than the CM Punk and Daniel Bryan feud. I guess they were trying to make it as unpredictable as possible. I remember being confused as to how it would go, because there was a few possibilities. But about that, it was announced as no disqualification. And I'd say it was my favorite in the whole Brian and Punk story. Their previous match was technically superb. This one was attractive in another area, and no, I ain't talking about AJ. But it was the violence, the intensity, and that's why I prefer over, over the limit. And it goes to show just how talented these men are. Because in my opinion, this was as good of a no DQ match as that over the limit match was as a singles match. So let's talk. Already it was intense. Ryan showed more viciousness and aggression compared to Punk. AJ for the first time didn't make everything about herself. And there was this little moment where she took a bump and was taken to the back. She would return, but for the time being, another ref took her place. They started bringing out weapons and this is when it gets interesting. Obviously you can notice that with Booker T going, oh, you know it's about to be good. These two were just out there killing each other with kicks, whipping each other with kendo sticks like a government mule and kid me was all for it. AJ did eventually return and decide to play a game, but despite this, she felt empathy for both men. It was high drama, she was extremely conflicted, you know, one minute's Brian, the next is Punk, but ultimately though, it didn't matter who she was feeling for because both men went through a table and CM Punk by the skin of his teeth retained the title. At this point, it was 248 days, and I wouldn't disagree if somebody said this was his best match in the run so far. It was really that damn good, and if you've never watched it before, what, what are you waiting for? As I said, it featured violence, drama, great action as well, oh, and who could forget the Phoenix crowd? But yes, the AJ arc was over. She was somewhat disappointed afterwards and nobody knows to this day why she was all sad, but it was over. Overall, I thought the matches between Punk and Ryan were extremely compelling. They always delivered in twice on Sunday. You want a technical masterpiece? They did it. You want a non-stop triple threat? They did it. You want a match involving a woman who made everything so damn dramatic? They did it. And my favorite over the bunch was of course Money in the Bank. Later that night, John Cena won his first Money in the Bank briefcase. This was the weirdest thing at the time in still is because this is John Cena, he's the top guy in the company, why the hell would he need money in the bank? I mean, he's marketable and he's always going to get these opportunities, and I'm talking in kayfabe of course. But at the end of the day though, it was clear from the very beginning that these two were separated, and since the feud was so damn good initially, it's a no-brainer to do it again. The next night on Raw, CM Punk started looking forward. He discussed the events of last night, and seeing as Raw was in Las Vegas, he of course mentioned the pipe bomb. Punk was also proud of being a part of the thousandth episode of Raw, but Big Show interrupted. He made a mockery out of his promo and whined about money in the bank. Big Show even claimed that he would have cashed it on Punk, and the champ stuck to the almost statement and put it simply. Big Show causes destruction, he whoops everybody's ass, but at the end of the day, he lost. Punk talked about how the fans respect him, whereas Big Show has a big contract with zero respect. The Giant claimed that if Punk left WWE, the fans would move on within a week, and he wasn't seeking out respect. Hell, he even admitted that the company revolved around one man, and I believe we all know who that one man was, and no, it wasn't CM Punk. Punk responded calling Big Show an underachieving, well-paid person who just so happens to be a giant. He responded telling Punk that after their match tonight, maybe just maybe John Cena will cash in. Fast forward to the end of the night, CM Punk took a huge beating, and John Cena of all people comes to the rescue. He was out here to announce something huge, and Big Show, he thought Cena was going to cash in then and there. He began getting into his head, mentioning how the title design is his, and mentioned the referee, and it was a huge opportunity. Ultimately though, John Cena turned into RVD and told CM Punk that he's got one week's time to prepare for the match, and he informed the best in the world, the match is going down at Raw 1000. 
Oh, and Big Show took a briefcase shot. Huge stakes on a huge night. This was something special. The occasion also made the match somewhat unpredictable. Add to that, the money in the bank at the time had a 100% success chance. On the other side of things, CM Punk was WWE Champion for 256 days, and Raw 1000 was as big as occasion where you could have a title match. So there was a mysterious sense heading into it. At the same time, a certain Brahma Bull made his return after three months. The last time we saw Rock on Raw, he promised to be WWE Champion. Here, though, it was clear that he wasn't joking. Add to that, WWE was very interested in continuing The Rock's return story. With that said, he was back in the same city he won his first world championship. He roasted Daniel Bryan, calling him a troll from Lord of the Rings before getting serious for a minute. Punk's acting like he's cool with all this, but he eventually revealed his true intentions. You see, Rock won the WWE title. He revealed that at the Royal Rumble, whoever is WWE Champion, then he will face him. Punk started getting all confident telling him whoever, and then he claimed that he's going to beat John Cena and then beat The Rock at the Royal Rumble. The Great One passed that confidence back to CM Punk telling him that he's going to win the title at the Royal Rumble, and a bitter Brian appeared and he got a wedding gift in the form of a rock bottom. But back to CM Punk. His match with Cena for the time given was good. I'm not going to come up here and say it's a must watch because it's not. That goes to the post match, but it felt similar to their previous ones. It's like the cheaper version on the light version. They were just showcasing what they were capable of, and at one point Cena had the match won, but the referee was down and Big Show randomly popped up and promised to knock him out. CM Punk was awkwardly just sitting in the corner wrongfully observing John Cena take a KO punch and the champion did seem somewhat conflicted but he went for it and Cena kicked out. This GTS attempt went south leading to the STF and suddenly Big Show runs in again to cause the DQ. This also made John Cena the first person to unsuccessfully cash in the money in the bank briefcase. He took a beating, Punk was just standing there all sad and turned his back. Suddenly The Rock comes in for the rescue and he dropped Big Show with a spine on a pine. He was ready for the people's elbow but CM Punk clotheslined the living hell out of him and the fans booed this. The commentary were in shock and the best in the world concluded this attack with the GTS. Big moment there. CM Punk didn't appreciate somebody, well not somebody but both John Cena and The Rock stealing his thunder. This had been suppressed for about a year but he just had to let it out I guess. Big Show had been in his ear the previous week about how there's only one main guy in the company and his ego couldn't allow this. Also to me this didn't mark Punk's heel turn. However, it was the beginning of it. He came out the next week with a slightly altered look. Instead of a beard, he was leaning towards a mustache. The reason why Punk was here was to explain his actions. He noted the King's commentary from Raw 1000 and how he said, quote, CM Punk has turned his back on the WWE Universe. He didn't understand this because Rock is not the WWE Universe. He's one person, and the champion didn't appreciate the lack of respect coming from the great one as well. Also, what I mentioned earlier about Punk standing there, yeah, he mentioned this. Attacking him at the end of the night was simply a warning to inform Rock of what's to come at the Royal Rumble. Punk also said that when Rock was feuding with Cena, it was a struggle to shut him up. To him, Raw 1000 ended the correct way with the spotlight on the WWE Champion, the best in the world himself. Man, I haven't seen this promo since 2012. It's like clearing dust. Big Show made the interruption and agreed that the focus was on Punk at the end of the Raw 1000, but in reality, it was on him because he was the one who cost John Cena the title, and for somebody who was the best in the world, even though Big Show helped him, he still found himself in the STF, and if anything, it's Big Show who kept the title on Punk's waist. All of a sudden, John Cena made a run in and brought with the Big Show. Once again, Punk took offense to this. It was the same old spotlight taken away from him, and it was the same person, the Green Fruity Pebble. Then AJ came out and revealed that Big Show's facing John Cena with the winner going to SummerSlam to face CM Punk for the title. Later on, the champion took notice of this and stuck it to Cena low-key. It was all about being passive-aggressive and said that he did to rock what Cena failed to do to him for over a year. Now with regards to the number one contender match, yeah, CM Punk got involved but not because he wanted to, at least initially. But in light of this, he pulled a Triple H 1999 and tried to clear out the competition. He announced that nobody's the winner, but AJ Lee ruined his parade. She announced that it's a triple threat match, and when he heard this, he got crazy. And if you were watching his story here, it had been a very long time since he was barking like this. And basically, he was seeking respect at this point. Word of the day, word of the month, word of the year was respect. However, despite all the barking, all the screaming and shouting, Punk acknowledged his wrongdoings and apologized. She accepted and all was good. At least that's what it looked like because CM Punk still felt that last week was a huge mistake and he wanted the triple threat match canceled. She didn't budge and Punk thought there was still some resentment over the whole proposal thing and come to think about it, how the hell was that a month ago? John Cena interrupted and called out Punk for his complaining and he didn't understand how the champion could succumb to this. He was the last person expected to change, you know, Punk's talking about, oh, we won't change this. We ended up turning on everyone. To see, you know, it's not about getting respect. He had to earn it. And about last week, Punk blamed him for everything that went down. Because he was just sitting on commentary. Cena confidently told him to continue whining about respect. Because at the end of the day, he's not going to be champion at SummerSlam. And there's the big show. 
The commentary was so desperate to make it seem like he had a huge chance, but a five-year-old could obviously see through it. AJ managed to weather the storm and fast forward to the end of the night. CM Punk asserted his dominance over Cena, who could care less and opted to fight the Big Show. This was once again seen as a disrespectful move by the champ, and so Punk whined about it. He refused to be disrespected as he's been for a while now. But for all that talk he was doing, one punch was enough to shut him up. Tensions continued to arise as CM Punk was hell-bent on getting the respect that he, quote, deserved. The man even went as far as to steal John Cena's moveset, and he responded doing the same exact thing because of this he walked out. It didn't matter though because this is John Cena we're talking about. He ended up winning the match alone. Afterwards, Punk struck his other opponent with a title and offered its hand out, but Cena just stared at him, and the reason why the best in the world did all of that is because John was apparently selfish. And yes, his hand not being shook is a sign of disrespect. Mans was seeking respect like I'm seeking 100k, but with that said, the match at SummerSlam is decent. To be honest, you don't have much of a reason to watch because it was only a way of actually restarting the CM Punk and John Cena feud, and somewhat forgettable. At this point, he had been champion for about 272 days, and I also love how Michael Cole tried defending CM Punk's change of character, citing the last time the champion main evented was at TLC 2011. As expected, Big Show proved to be a huge challenge for both men. He showcased his size and strength, it was basic triple threat stuff. Big Show, though, was the glue here. He was a one-man wrecking crew, and Punk and Cena didn't really interact much around here. Then came the controversial finish. Big Show tapped out to both men's submission home. They whined to the ref about him, but AJ came out and resolved the situation. Well, kind of. Once again, CM Punk rested his case and asked for the fans to decide, but she could care less and restarted the match. Cena complained like he was a heel, and once again, Big Show, he had control. But he blew it. And Cena hit the AA. Punk tosses him out and goes for the 1 2 3. And yes, John Cena had that look on his face. Decent match, but not good considering the talent involved. Moving on, the second city safe felt that he deserved to select his next opponent for the WWE Championship match. A random guy asked him, Oh, is there any controversy in your victory? Well, Punk was actually logical here. As for his opponent, well, he wasn't an unexpected person. It was John Cena. But it's obvious where Punk was going with this. He said that he will give John Cena a title shot if he gets respect. Fast forward to the end of the night, and the WWE Champion tried explaining why he should get respect and refused to take a backseat to somebody he beat at SummerSlam. It was pushing Cena's buttons. He wanted the respect, and this is basically the 2012 version of Acknowledge Me. He wanted Cena to say that CM Punk is the best in the world. Cena did hesitate to give Fresno some respect, but as for Punk, <laughs> no. Sure, he may throw away a title shot, but if he were to acknowledge him, it would contradict his belief of being the best. It basically shows that he doesn't believe in himself, and he congratulated Punk for nine months, but reminded him that a few years ago, he was the one holding the title for 380 days, and no, he wasn't lying to anybody. Best of all, though, John Cena told Punk that nobody remembers your run, and if anything, all they remember is you giving Mr. McMahon a kiss. If you want respect, prove it. Now, long story short, Cena was saying, to be the man, you have to beat the man. Beating him at Night of Champions in his own hometown would define Punk's legacy. Choosing anybody else in his eyes shows that Punk has no respect for the title, nor himself. Damn, he shut him up. Like, how often do we see CM Punk keep his mouth shut? He doesn't keep his mouth closed all that much. All of a sudden, he told Jerry Law that he wanted an apology. The man was still annoyed over the whole turn his back on the WWE Universe name, and the King followed through, but turn his back and we all know what that means. It certainly doesn't mean respect. CM Punk then wanted him to say that he is the best in the world. And this is when problems arose. The King couldn't bring himself to say that, so Punk whacked him with a kick to the back of the head. Alright, I consider this the official heel turn. Raw 1000 was the beginning of my eyes and it slowly built to that moment. You know, it started becoming more aggressive, more rude, more demanding, you know, a lot more respect as the weeks went by. And it slowly built to this moment. Since WWE was in love with Twitter like a wrestler's in love with entrance gear, the feud intensified on Twitter. Jerry Lawler then paid back the favor, demanding an apology for himself, and once again for the 17th time, lack of respect this or that. But well, let's fast forward. CM Punk trashed the King over last week, and you mentioned how he took an L to Michael Cole at WrestleMania and claimed that somebody was barking a bunch of stuff in his ears. The man was trying to goad him into a fight, and this worked very well in his favor, but before we knew it, they were facing off in a steel cage match. AJ Lee, meanwhile, announced that John Cena is the next opponent at Night of Champions with regards to the main event. I remember this. It was notable to me because Punk showed way more intensity and aggression around here. Add to that, he did a blade job neck deep in the PG era. There it is. This match was basically like the end of a first episode heel CL Punk show. It was to showcase that this man has changed for the worse. Afterwards, John Cena had to make a run in to prevent any further damage. This was all because CM Punk wanted Lawler to acknowledge him. But wait, there's more. CM Punk found enough time to attack him the very following week. In his hometown of Chicago, about as predictable as anything, he received a warm welcome and he stole Sheamus' thunder by speaking for several minutes. This led to a champion versus champion match for the second hour of Raw. Punk came out wearing the same clothes as earlier and he took advantage of the fans saying that since it's Labor Day, he's doing the same thing as them, and yes, he was booed for this. Although you could hear some cheers. Sheamus saw this as a very huge sign of disrespect, but Punk was gone. 
In other places, John Cena was busy with Alberto Del Rio. This is a false count anywhere match and it concluded with a huge ending. You see, the hometown hero made his return canceling his personal day and dropped Cena with a kick. To top it all off, he tossed him into the car and decided, you know what, I'm done here. Suddenly, the driver turns out to be Paul Heyman. As we all know, these two had mutual respect for one another. You know, Heyman was there for Punk and OVW and he was also mentioned in the pipe bomb. So, it's an interesting story when we're looking at it from that time period. Seeing as Raw was in Montreal, the hitman Bret Hart made his first appearance in Montreal since 1997. He interviewed both John Cena and CM Punk. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because, in my opinion, it's one of the most notable segments to come from this run of CM Punk's. Bret asked Cena, how are you going to shut up the phony little punk? And he came out. This clearly offended him, but Cena added fuel to the fire. He called him a phony as well, and as expected, Punk called out Cena's phoniness and was so desperate to defend his name. The champion thought it was wild that Cena and the Hitman were alike, not for any good reasons, and Punk refused to be compared to Shawn Michaels nor Stone Cold. Instead, he decided to call himself the best technician. Obviously, this was a dig at Bret Hart. He also called himself the best brawler, which was, of course, a dig at John Cena. To John, that final statement made Punk a liar and a hypocrite. He said that CM Punk for 300 days had been champion and for 300 days it's been irrelevant and the end of the day he's complaining about some weird conspiracy against him but and this is what cena said he said that the night punk made the most noise was when his mic was turned silent back then there he was pitching and fighting for change but the fans were lied to the only thing punk fought for was himself john cena on the other hand he's always stayed the same person unlike punk who steals things things such as the color of legends in his trunks the elbow from Randy Savage, this was all because Punk failed to find his true self. Cena even found some time to speak in French, and this is when the champion responded. He said that Cena lowered himself with the hats off and John's in six gear. He said that he didn't lower himself. They're the reason they're here, and the crowd, well, I don't remember him being this loud. It was one of the loudest, most underrated pops I've ever heard. Yeah, I don't like using underrated a lot, but here they definitely were. Cena translated his message from French and said, quote, you say you're going to win at Night of the Champions, but I'm just going to kick your ass. Excitement and hype was off the charts, and since he was so butthurt over Cena's words, Punk was ready to blast Brett, who was more than prepared. That was one hell of a promo. I did wonder why it's not talked about often, but I realized it fell on a very dark night, and Mandela got me once again. I seem to remember CM Punk actually dropping Brett with a punch. Obviously, people are not going to like how Punk was portrayed in the promo, but Cena's delivering was superb, and it definitely deserves more love. He belittled Punk in his title reign, and it did make him look somewhat arrogant. As if Punk was lucky he had yet to cross paths with him, and it made their match at Night of Champions that much interesting. It was already going to be interesting because it's John Cena and CM Punk, but this was something additional. The champion was talking about how CM lost sight a year ago, yet he's done the same exact thing here. Loved it. With regards to their match at Night of Champions, damn, these two always have hits, zero misses, and what's funny is that this match is not even close to their best. First of all, the event was in Boston. JBL made his return on commentary, adds that CM Punk wanted to suppress that crowd by donning Yankees colors, and by the sounds of it, it worked. Because how in the hell are you going to cheer the rival? I mean, you won't see somebody donning Real Madrid colors and getting cheered in Barcelona. He also spent two minutes sucking his own ass with the longest pose with that title. And despite all of this, some of the fans were chanting Cena sucks. Early on, the champion was somewhat in control when compared to John Cena. Wasn't outright or anything like that, but he had more luck. The face that runs the place did find a moment where he dropped Punk with a suplex on the outside. But other than that, the second city saint was ahead. Suddenly, Cena unlocked the comeback sequence, but I guess Punk pressed the right buttons. This caused Cena to actually do something new and hit a damn suicide dive. But the moment Cena went back to what he knew, he was caught in the Anaconda device. And this is when I'd say the match was kicked up a notch. It was already good, but this elevated it. Several counters into finishers, signatures, high drama all around. Inside, outside the ring, there was some superb action. Punk gave Cena his best shot, but it wasn't enough for the three count. Cena, on the other hand, gave Punk his very best shot, but the title was still on Cena Punk's shoulders. Epic encounter. The crowd was exciting, the commentary was reacting to everything, and CM Punk as well was trying new things in an effort to end this. His second GTS was kicked out of it at this point. Well, were you seriously doubting a potential John Cena win? I mean, it was looking like that was going to happen because he kicked out of the GTS twice. So he went for a rock bottom, and again, the crowd went insane, but John Cena made sure to beat the count. He caught Punk with the AA and it was looking like he was going to become a 12 time champion, but he wasn't. So Cena went up to the very top rope and went for a super German suplex. One, two, three, new champion. That Boston crowd exploded. Cena ran off and took that belt, celebrating with the crowd, but little did he know, the referee was constantly pestering him and took that title away like it was candy. It was heading back to Punk and he blasted the hell out of John Cena before standing tall as a barely triumphant Yankee. 
So this match ended in a draw. Fans were pissed with how things went. It was a match marred in controversy. It was clear that a rematch was on the horizon. After that, John Cena technically beat CM Punk clean. In other places, Mick Foley had a huge problem with CM Punk's recent change of attitude. He warned him about Paul Heyman and said that it's baffling that he needed a mouthpiece. The conversation got to hell and a sound Foley talked about how he earned respect that night in 1998 and preferred if CM Punk actually tried to prove that he's the best in the world by facing John Cena inside the cell. Upon hearing this, CM Punk lashed out. He said that Cena and Brett said the same thing after SummerSlam, and unlike Brett, Punk didn't want to touch Foley. He's beneath him. Matter of fact, he said that Mick was a joke for doing all kinds of things to his body in order to receive adulation from the crowd. The hardcore legend responded saying he held that title for 29 days, but he's still relevant, and he revealed that despite seeing a surgery, John's in the building tonight, and Punk was allowed to make his decision regarding the pay-per-view. Fast forward to the end of the night. Yes, John Cena had surgery on his elbow, and this caused his status for Hell in a Cell to become doubtful. Unlike the past, Cena didn't guarantee he was going to win this match. Now, obviously, he guaranteed that he will wrestle, but we all know what happened. Cena's speech caused CM Punk to say he should have been a politician. He even said that his title reign will not end at the hand of a one-armed man. Punk admitted that he doesn't want to face John Cena Hell in a Cell. Why? Because Cena wasn't medically clear. He threatened him saying he's got till the count of five to walk away. Suddenly it's revealed that John Cena had the great equalizer. In an effort to regain some heat, I guess, Punk blasted Mick Foley afterwards and accidentally crossed paths with Ryback, who was over as hell. Now around this time period, Ryback was a fresh tell. He was destroying everybody in sight and had this undefeated streak. And slowly he was getting the fans' attention, and you can clearly notice the similarities of his push to Goldberg's in 1998. After disrespecting yet another legend the following week, Ryback came to Jim Ross's aid. Clearly the feud was brewing. John Cena, on the other hand, was going from a number one contender to mascot. At the same time, Mr. McMahon reigned a rare appearance on Raw, and CM Punk took this as a chance to latch on him and criticize him for a bunch of things. McMahon saw this as a sign of disrespect, but Punk flipped it over and said that it was disrespectful of McMahon to talk about champions without referencing him. The promo eventually steered in the direction of respect, and McMahon was jumping around the bush. He's saying, I respect the fact that you were champion for a long time, but I don't respect you being a Paul Heyman guy. And the boss himself even admitted that he wasn't a CM Punk guy, and the champion was happy to hear the truth. The best in the world referenced his pipe bomb promo and his mention of the spoken on the wheel thing, and claimed that he's advanced to a far greater level, and at this point, he's the damn wheel. At a moment where life imitated art, CM Punk said that if he didn't get the respect that he deserved, he's gonna walk out. Obviously, it's a bit deeper than that, but at face value, it's something. He pushed McMahon to the very brink, to the point where he wanted a match with the WWE Champion. Why? Because he wanted to teach him about respect. Punk was talking about how he's been slapped in the face for years, yada yada, and it led to a random Raw main event. It was intense. Obviously, Vince is limited, but he always brings it in a rolling environment. At one point, Punk wanted to run away. They engaged in a kendo stick fight, and that crowd was so into the match. They were shaking the arena, but one low blow put a stop to the situation, and just as he's ready to wrap it up, Ryback made the save. John Cena ran in and tossed Punk back in, Ryback closed on the hell out of him, and that crowd can be simply explained with one word. Explosive. Shortly afterwards, Mr. McMahon told the quote creep that he's got two choices for Hell in a Cell. Ryback or John Cena. I assume Punk was busy beating up a fan to hear this, but about his decision, yeah, he didn't make one. So McMahon was going to do it for him. Before that could go down, though, he decided to trash the people in front of him. John Cena once again praised his achievement of holding the title for so long, but he preferred if he shut the hell up. Cena endorsed Ryback, as did the crowd, and this led to the big guy signing the contract. Now, about Hell in a Cell, this was one of the toughest booking decisions they had to make at the time. By booking CM Punk, a guy who had the title for 343 days, and Ryback, the undefeated monster, something had to give. It's like forcing yourself into a corner. I'll get into the backstage details later, but let's talk about the match. To be honest, this was not a favorite of mine. We're certain it's my least favorite title match of the run. The challenge was pretty damn dominant early on. It was all over CM Punk, dropping Paul Heyman to his knees, and there was a small moment that could have led to something for the champ. Ultimately, Ryback was a brick house. The fans were all in on him. Punk's title was slowly grasping away from him, but then all of a sudden, the referee randomly low blowed Ryback. Okay, I do not remember this. I do remember a roll up in the fast count, but I have zero recollection of the low blow. Kind of caught me off guard. Nonetheless, Ryback lost the match for the first time in his career, well, technically, and destroyed the ref afterwards. He also ended the show on top by shell shocking CM Punk on top of the cell. So, in preparation for this video, I searched to see what the reports were at the time stating. Take it as you will. But I like mentioning this, I quote. The Wrestling Observer Newsletter reports that the original plan was for Ryback to pin CM Punk in the middle of the ring clean and win the WWE Championship. Ryback would then hold the belt through the Survivor Series and would eventually drop the belt in a multi-man gimmick match at TLC where he would have had to be pinned or submitted. 
This was a scenario Vince McMahon had settled on until Thursday, October 25th, just three days before Hell in a Cell. The following day, Friday, Vince made the call to keep the belt on CM Punk because Punk's long title reign was more important than Ryback's undefeated streak, which isn't really necessary to portray him as a monster. WWE had spent so much time focusing on CM Punk's long title reign that it would be better to keep the belt on him past the one year mark so his eventual match with the Rock at the Royal Rumble would have higher stakes. What do you guys think? Me personally, since Ryback had to face Punk in the main event, I feel he should've won. They booked themselves into a pretty awkward position and it didn't help Ryback at all. Is he my favorite? No. But you can't deny he was massively over. I was pretty interested in him at the time as well, and had he won that match, it would also change the trajectory of his career. Ryback himself also claims that this decision killed his push, but with that said, Punk rubbed it in the next night on Raw. At the same time, it was looking like a Survivor Series elimination match featuring the champion himself was on the horizon, but that would quickly be switched up. First of all, the Miz quit Team Punk and did the most random face turn I've seen from this era. That's another story. And most importantly, CM Punk was defending his title against both John Cena and Ryback for Survivor Series. That day was going to mark 364 days in the title run, and if things weren't bad enough, he lost to John Cena in the final round before the pay-per-view. Ryback and Cena did the tug-of-war thing, and that's the build. Clearly, it was rushed because over the past few weeks, it seemed like there was going to be a Mick Foley slash Punk feud. That didn't occur in his storyline. CM Punk was going to go through his toughest challenge. The match itself was much better than Hell in a Cell. It's not memorable though, it was just some regular triple threat stuff. Ryback was such a huge threat that John Cena and CM Punk had to slam him through the announce table. What this also meant was John Cena and CM Punk faced off yet again. They did what they do best and that's wrestle. This of course hyped up the crowd but then Ryback made his return and hit the meat hook clothesline before connecting with a shell shock. He did the same to John Cena but then a trio of guys wearing black randomly jumped him and they hit that triple power bomb and inside the ring CM Punk scored the W on John Cena who shockingly didn't kick out. These match we all know the one thing people still talk about to this very day and it wasn't the match itself. What this also meant was CM Punk is going to complete a year in his title reign. I don't think anybody expected that because there were some rumors that Punk was dropping the title because of the ratings. Add to that John Cena was always lurking, but he did it. It was a whole different man compared to the first day of his run, and I'll get into that later. The next night on Ross was a night of celebration. CM Punk listed a bunch of names that couldn't do it. They showed this highlight reel of Punk's superb year and it also showed just how much he changed from appearance to character. You know, lots happened in a year. Punk said that on July 25th, 2018, he will surpass Bruno San Martino as the longest reigning WWE champion of all time. And what's funny is that the champion at that time was AJ Styles, a guy who many thought would never come to WWE, let alone be the champion. Paul Heyman started holding CM Punk in much higher regard than Bruno, Hogan, Austin, and even said that The Rock couldn't beat Punk for the title at the Royal Rumble. The champion also called Survivor Series the previous night his best victory in the championship ring. Ryback, though, crushed the part. As he's walking down to the ring, the turtleneck trio tried to do something about it, and seeing Roman Reigns get manhandled like that is absolutely weird to see. We did a sequel to Survivor Series, and Punk was over the moon in light of this. Now, these three were running around attacking Ryback in particular. Suspicions grew over the connection between CM Punk and The Shield. They denied this, claiming they were working for each other in an effort to eradicate injustice. It also didn't help that The Shield did it for the third time the following week. At the same time, CM Punk was set to face Ryback at TLC. He was denying any sort of relationship with The Shield, causing The Miz to call him out on his lies. Punk thought it was extremely ironic that The Miz of all people was talking about lies, and I don't know why, but this image is bizarre. I mean, Miz is a babyface calling out CM Punk. It wasn't too long ago that the roles were reversed. Miz wasn't out here to fight. He wants CM Punk to prove that he's clean, show that he doesn't have a relationship with the Shield at all. How's he gonna do it? Well, he's gonna take a lie detector test. He called Paul Heyman a human walrus, which led to the fans chanting that, and the Miz was pushing their buttons. He was asking Punk to put the best in the world statement to the test, and he ended up accepting the quote, little idiot's test. Later that night, it occurred. After calling the Miz a bunch of stuff, Responding with some snide remarks, Miz also revealed that if Punk comes out a liar, Paul Heyman has to face Ryback. Miz was pretty petty with the questions he's asking about Over the Limit 2010 and WrestleMania 27. Punk was shown lying about beating Ryback alone and then the Miz asked a huge question. He asked CM Punk point blank, did you work with Brad Maddox in the Shield? All of a sudden though, they attacked. They left them laying but then Ryback and Team Hell No came out. Punk was too busy showboating in the ring that he forgot about his TLC challenger and so he paid the price. He ended up being powerbombed through the table and the ramifications of what had just occurred were almost catastrophic. Why? Because CM Punk suffered a knee injury. Now he wasn't doing so well in that area as claimed in an interview back in January 2013. He also talked about how the injury was suffered at Night of Champions and also reading about his interviews from this time period he was very adamant on taking a break around here. He felt that it was time to slow down after dropping the title. But the injury had been nagging him for a lot. Shortly afterwards he had surgery to remove a piece of torn meniscus that had locked up his knee. Now, I want to say Ryback did it, but Punk was scared of him at the time. You know, he'd be talking trash about him in interviews to this very day. 
Anyways, this meant the TLC match was called off. I mean, they wouldn't want to risk an injury on their top guy, add to that The Rock was going to face him. After being snubbed in every Slammy Award category, CM Punk took the time to make a rare appearance on SmackDown to complain. I don't know why out of all the rants he did during this time, this is the one I remember the most. He was so bitter about being overlooked in favor of John Cena, he went on a tirade about Ric Flair and how unlike the Nature Boy, he would rather hold the title for a long time than win 16 times, and then the topic went another direction. He was talking about the injury and how unlike others such as the Pittsburgh Penguins, he doesn't go on strike. Ryback heard enough and revealed some important information. He said that he was going to face CM Punk on the first Raw of 2013. Because of this, the champion claimed that Christmas had been ruined, and he also claimed that on January 7th, he will be unable to compete. In light of this, Mr. McMahon gave the second city Satan ultimatum. If you can't compete, then Paul Heyman will take your place. Add to that, McMahon was very suspicious over the whole collusion thing with Brad Maddox and the Shield. That would continue to develop in the coming weeks, but for the time being, CM Punk had to face Ryback in a TLC match. About this one, yes, it was better than Hell in a Cell. Add to that, it's a free TLC match, that alone would make it good. But the result was as obvious as a John Cena match from 2005. Let's talk about it. Ryback exhibited power and strength early on. Punk was not limping and from my perspective looked 100%. The situation looked pretty dire for him, but he quickly righted the ship for about 2 seconds because similar to Hell in a Cell, Ryback was on a roll. After the commercial, the champ finally isolated Ryback and he went after that ankle, but in the process, hurt himself. Nonetheless, Ryback screwed up and went through a table. This stopped him for a short moment and Punk's chances drastic go down after he was slammed through a table. He was climbing up and at this point the crowd was the loudest it had been. Then the lights went dim and the shield attacked. He got rid of them for two seconds with the moment a chair was brought in. Yeah, Ryback choked. Rocky chance intensified, but it didn't matter and Ryback was slammed through a table. CM Punk desperately crawled towards the ladder and he slowly climbed the rungs. He retrieved the title and I don't think a single soul in the world didn't expect this. The match was decent enough, but it's not a notable TLC match at all. The moment it finished, you're thinking about The Rock and Royal Rumble. At the same time, there was hype behind The Rock's return. This was the first time he was appearing since Raw 1000, and since then, a lot happened. Because of this, CM Punk promised to open his mouth and drop another pipe bomb. Fast forward to the end of the night, a battered and beaten champion came out all serious. He mentioned how people thought he was this disgruntled person who let his ego go wild two years ago. Punk affirmed that everything he said was true, except for the ice cream thing, claiming that these fans don't need ice cream. He also said that whatever you do, there is a glass ceiling, and it didn't matter if you were the best wrestler overall, all that mattered was popularity. That's the reason why John Cena gets title shots, that's why submission specialists like Daniel Ryan has catchphrases and does the yes thing. He also said that if he competed in Bruno San Martino's days, he would have been champion for 30 years. He also said that his success wasn't because of the fans, but in spite of them. He didn't want to be perceived as a good guy, rather the opposite. The WWE champion spoke so much that they wanted to go to a commercial break, and he told the fans that they don't matter. Afterwards, the man was still trashing the fans, talking about how he's been stepping on them for the entire time, and after 20 minutes of Punk rambling on about how they don't matter or whatever, and it was just Triple H-esque in terms of length, like it was so damn long, The Rock finally interrupted. As we said earlier, last time Rocky was in a WWE arena, CM Punk laid him out with a GTS. The reason why it took so long was to allow CM Punk to reveal who he is. That being delusional. He praised Punk massively for his excellent title reign, but he informed him that in 20 days, time's up. And on the comments of how the fans turned on him, no. The Rock called him a failure for not providing ice cream. And for all that talk of being the voice of the voiceless, Rocky didn't see it. He didn't understand it because the fans have their own voices. He initiated the Cookie Puss chant and the champion was seething. He called them out on their mistakes, talking about how the fans lost. Rock offered his rebuttal, saying the moment they won was when he woke up at 4 in the morning. And Tampa was electric. Before you say it's because he's arrogant, Rock claims that they're happy to see him back because he was going to whoop CM Punk's ass and take that title. The Great One was so fed up with the whole respect thing and he took a jab at Punk's appearance saying, For somebody with straight edge, he's running around here looking exactly like Popeye on crack. Despite all the talk, he spoke positively about the champion for a bit but criticized him for not using his mind well and being a jackass. Speaking on behalf of the fans, Rock said that it's Punk who didn't matter. He tried laughing it off and responded, but that was quickly shut down. Now. You can notice that a fire was brewing within Punk. He silently said that it didn't matter how many movies Rock films, whatever he does, he'll kick his ass. And he could make fun of his shirt, do his tired lame shtick, don't matter, he's gonna kick his ass at the Royal Rumble. He said that Rock's playing Little League with his childish insults while he's in the big leagues, and then he's like, come Royal Rumble, understand when you step in the ring your arms are just too short to box with God. CM Punk didn't want to deal with The Rock. To him it's all childish trash talk and all that mattered was what happened in the ring. This is when Punk started to grow a God complex. He started becoming much more confident and arrogant than usual. With that said, Rock wasn't trying to undermine CM Punk. He knew just how good the man was. 414 days he was champion. And the last time they were in the ring, Rock was embarrassed. But in 20 days, Time's up. The Grey One suggested the champion go home and strip naked. Why? To look at his backside, to add tattoos to his ugly body, and to add M&M Snickers, but not Almond Jays, because he doesn't have nuts. And from out of nowhere, 
you hit the rock bottom. Wow. Truly one of my all-time favorite promos. Punk did not look out of place at all. He stood his ground and his storyline showed that he ain't no cookie puss but the WWE Champion. A man who restored respect and prestige to the title for 414 days. Rock, on the other hand, he didn't marry Punk. He verbally praised him and elevated him by making him seem like a huge threat. Punk perceived himself to have ascended to such a high level that it was calling himself God. And Rock tried bringing him down to earth like, calm down, man, you're facing the great one. John Cena wasn't really going to take Punk's promos that seriously. It's something that a lot of people don't like about him. They once again confronted each other the next week. And similar to their previous encounter, Rock said that it's a fact that nobody stopped CM Punk. It's also a fact that Paul Heyman has twinky tits, and on the whole boxing with God thing, well, Punk ain't God, but God as his witness, he promised to beat CM Punk for the WWE title. Then a brawl ensued between the two, and the intensity and aggression was off the charts. Bunch had to forcefully separate them. On the final raw, both men crossed past one last time. CM Punk called this his life's work. So that 428 days was nothing, as it was just a fraction of the time compared to what it took him to attain it. He said that The Rock is here to entertain while he's here to hurt people and be champion. To him, the title is prestigious because he made it that way. Rock, though, what's prestigious to him is the people which, according to Punk, were meaningless. He talked about how in the past he had to make a choice. He chose to be honest and arrogant, whereas The Rock chose the people. He said that whatever the fans call him, they couldn't call him champion. The champion told Rock to enjoy the people, the cheers, the chants, the signs. I'm like the great one. He realized that a long time ago that the people don't matter. Now, this clearly wasn't the end of Punk's night. Not at all. After Paul Heyman mistakenly called The Rock stupid, not realizing that he found a way into the arena, he was left pissing himself in fear. Heyman tried saying, oh, the ticket doesn't allow you to enter the ring, but Rock could just shut him up and called him Twinkie Tits. Unlike John Cena, The Rock felt that CM Punk earned the right to be called the best in the world. However, he informed him that this is going to be his final Raw as champion. Like Martin Luther King, The Rock had a dream. The dream was to climb to the top of the mountain. Hell, he even promised to win and said that everybody from Brazil to Miami, when Rock wins, they'll be saying free at last. Punk took a page out of Cena's book and left it off and some of the lights went out and the shield attacked. They overwhelmed the Great One and hit the triple powerbomb. Right afterwards, CM Punk told him that there's room for only one man at the top of that mountain. Punk likened Rock's dream to an actual dream, saying that once he wakes up, he's going to realize that the Great One wasn't great enough to beat the best in the world. And a few minutes later, these two awkwardly met Mr. McMahon. They enjoyed seeing The Rock take a beating, and this is when McMahon said that if the Shield interfere at the pay-per-view, CM Punk will be script of the title. So that's the build. To CM Punk, The Rock was yet another challenger. At face value, he wasn't worried. This man went through Alberto Del Rio, Chris Jericho, Dan O'Brien, John Cena, all these men. So why would he be worried over some guy who hasn't competed full-time in 10 years? The Rock, on the other hand, it was all about saving the fans from this misery, I guess. And that's basically it. Right before the match, he cut this very intense, inspirational promo about his life and about never quitting. That said, Second City say CM Punk held the title for 434 days up to this point. That number would become synonymous with his career. And whatever you could say about his title reign, at the end of the day, CM Punk held the most coveted title in WWE longer than John Cena, The Rock, Stone Cold, Randy Savage, and AJ Styles ever did. And that's an elite list right there. The match itself was good, the intensity was there of course, and I feel it's often overlooked. I watched it two years ago and thought it was fun, and right now we're gonna talk about it. The action was very back and forth early on, nobody took control, but after Paul Heyman got involved, that changed. CM Punk was slowly wearing the Rock down, and Rock's ring roast got the best of him here. He failed to break through and allowed CM Punk to inflict more damage, and even when he started fighting back, it led nowhere. Pressure was on him, and the Great One did lock the sharpshooter in, but ultimately CM Punk reached the bottom rope. The table apparently didn't want to put over the guys, but nonetheless, Rock hit the Rock bottom. Neither man was letting go, but then all of a sudden, Rock had the advantage. He was ready to hit the people's elbow, but then the lights went out, and yes, it was the shield. The fans in the arena were outraged by this, and once the lights turned on, Punk woke up with a smile on his face, and he was ready to wrap it up. Goes to the cover, one, two, three. Some of the fans did look disappointed with the result, while others, a minority, were joyous. Then Mr. McMahon came out. He relayed the information from the previous week and was ready to strip him of the title. The Rock put a stop to this. He didn't want to end this night like that. He demanded they restart the match, and since Rock had the part-time attribute, he got what he wanted. Fans are hyped now, Punk's momentum fizzled, and it went to The Rock. He quickly tried suppressing that momentum, but it didn't work, and Rock dropped him with a spine buster, and then the people's elbow, one, two, Three. It had been nearly 11 years since Rock captured Championship Gold. I don't think anybody believed it would happen. And this image in itself is bizarre. Like the Rock with a spinner title? The hell? It was a comeback story. A man who didn't really show much doubt managed to prove himself right. Now, with regards to the match, I think if you were to watch it, you'd enjoy it. Rock and Punk had some very overlooked matches. And we always talk about the result and the ramifications instead of the match itself. It was a very enjoyable match. And we'll see where that 77 year old that was shot. Poor guy took a bullet and despite that said that CM Punk's title loss was the worst moment of his week. Now CM Punk losing the title to The Rock, 
a good decision. Well, it depends on what you think. Me, personally, I would have preferred to see him walk into WrestleMania and lose it to John Cena, but the guy who had never been CM Punk in a one-on-one -on -one match on pay-per-view. But hey, that's just me. So that's the title reign. What a run. I don't care, oh, he never made an event this or that. He had a great run. Once the bell rang, he was nearly in form in every single match. I watched all the title matches for this video. Most of them were good to great, and I get it. I get it. Oh, he did a main event. Yeah, I know, but still, at the end of the day, he had some great promos, some great matches. His character in general was the best damn character from that time period. I just love the fact that Punk realized, hey, I'm never going to be as big as these guys in the fans' eyes. I want respect. I want the same respect they got. It's something I really loved about the run. You know, he actually changed as time went on. My favorite promo from this title run, the one with Chris Jericho swimming with sharks, dancing with stars. My favorite match of the run is either CM Punk vs. John Cena and Nada Champions, or CM Punk vs. Chris Jericho WrestleMania 28. It's one of those two. He was certainly number two. He did very well in that position. Should he have main events at WrestleMania? I feel like he should have. You know, it was his year, but hey, business is business. All right, what'd you guys think of CM Punk's title ring? Please comment down below. And that's it for this video. Make sure you hit the Anaconda device on the like button, and perhaps the GTS and the subscribe button. Peace. I'm out.